is LBC from Global. Leading Britain's conversation with Matt Stadlin. Very, very good morning to you. Now, I was going to talk to you about the B word, but I think a combination of Nick Abbott and a headline that has just dropped has rather put me off. I think maybe instead we could talk about the fact that the police are getting more stop and search powers to combat knife crime. Police in England and Wales have been given greater stop and search powers to tackle knife crime. The Home Secretary, Sajid Javid, of course, one of those vying for the top job, so we're led to believe, is making it easier for officers to search people without reasonable suspicion in places where serious violence may occur. So in other words, you could have unreasonable suspicion and yet still, as a police officer, stop and search someone. I'm going to be asking you over the course of the next hour, is this a good idea? Or could this heighten tensions between some communities and the police who serve them? 0345 6060 973. Also delighted to say that joining me in the studio in just about half an hour's time is none other than Aaron AJ. And I can tell you, because I can see him through the glass, that he's got an instrument. Which means there won't just be jokes, there'll be music too. Matt Stadler on LBC. Call 0345 6060 973. Yes, this is Matt Stadlin. This is LBC, and we're going to unpick this little bit of scheduling or programme making right now together live. Because what we were going to be doing now is speaking to the Australian comedian Aaron AJ. But then, as you'll recall, about half an hour ago, as I was introducing the show, I decided to change topics from the B word to knife crime. I thought we'd had enough of the B word just for the moment. And so instead of talking to Aaron, we're going to bring Aaron back at three o'clock, which, by the way, of course, would have been two o'clock had the clocks not by now sprung forward and then we will talk to Aaron about exactly the same things that we were going to talk to him about at two o'clock which of course in the old days would have been one o'clock but nonetheless just to prove to you that Aaron is not a figment of my imagination and that he is here and his surname is AJ would you like to say hello to the LBC audience zone morning Matt morning everybody do you feel safe on the streets of London? Um, you look sometimes. like a pretty tough, tough chap. Oh, it depends. I hardly go out these days. Well, not at night anyway, so I'm definitely taking an Uber home after this. But getting in here, were you doing a gig tonight? No. So you were right walking through the, the, the streets, yeah, getting yeah, through Leicester Square? Because yeah, it gets a bit dicey around here, I find. I mean, I run the gauntlet when I leave at five in the morning. My goodness, some of the characters you see out and about. Definitely. And they're usually drunk or they're high. Yeah. And so they don't know what's good for them. They don't realise that if they were to start a fight with me, they'd end up losing because they have an inflated sense of themselves at that point of the morning. Absolutely. I find that just don't make any eye contact. Best way forward. Absolutely. Well, funnily enough, actually, and I'm six foot three, and even though I've lost a bit of weight, still over 15 stone, when I was walking back to my car last Sunday morning at five, this guy looked at me and I just... You, you, there were three of them and you, you, you kind of pick it up usually sometimes it could take you by surprise but usually you have a sense that there's no good going on yeah and i looked at him and then i carried on and i happened to be running because it's a bit nippy and i wanted to get back to my car and it was late already and then when i was sort of safely out of his range about 20 meters or so he, he suddenly shouted oi after <laughs> me and it's kind of weird isn't it that sort of Very behavior weird. but was he actually owing to you though you think i imagined was? he was owing to me i don't think that was me in a state of paranoia anyway i just kept running i couldn't be bothered with turning around and saying oi back or trying to prove myself because of course with so many knives around in london it's just not worth it is it no not at all not at all streets of australia safer um, parts of sydney are pretty rough it depends like I, i've um i was in sydney earlier this year and um i'm pretty sure they do have a problem but it just depends on the areas that you actually you know you actually go to bellevue um, hill don't get much nice crime road <laughs> ashfield on the other hand might be a bit trickier mount Druitt, um yeah that's a that's a pretty uh, bad place as well but i mean in the city um especially on george street probably around like three four in the morning you do get the similar crowd like you do here people going to the uh K KFC or getting a kebab or something like that. Oxford Street? Oxford Street, um, yeah. Um, I actually used to live around there years and years ago when I used to work in Sydney. And it can, it just, again, it just depends. If you look for it, you'll find it. Um, if you mind your own business, it's only going to be your bad luck if something actually happens to you. Now, my esteemed producer, Nick, prom made me promise to him that when you came in, I wouldn't do what I normally do when we have a comedian on my show early hours, and that is to introduce you by saying, you are a comedian and you're going to make us laugh. But you are going to make us laugh, aren't you? Uh, yeah, I hope so. Uh, are we talking about the B word later on, are we? I think we could touch on it. I've got a resume here, 
and it's it, it, it notes all the different things or many of the different things you've done and you've worked as an information technology auditor not on the face of it amusing and then as a management consultant also not laugh out loud funny worked as a commodities trading floor analyst worked as a project manager for various clients delivering new it systems i mean this is not a, this is not promising but i think but i get the sense that you are able to to make us laugh out of that material uh yeah absolutely uh doing that sort of job during the day you do need a bit of a sense of humor i think you i think you do i think we need to have a sense of humor as brits given what we are being subjected to with this brexit mess so we'll reintroduce you if that's okay in about 20 minutes we've got lots of callers on knife crime no worries i will see you in a second thank you very much to aaron aj this is lbc from global leading britain's conversation with matt stadler could someone call up to steve allen please and just ask him to send down a chocolate Steve Allen is in the house. Not quite sure why he's here so early, but anyway, it was in fantastic form. If Jacob Rees-Mogg, Boris Johnson, David Davis get to change their minds about supporting Theresa May's deal, and Jacob Rees-Mogg and Boris Johnson only did that at the third time of asking, David Davis at the second, should we, the public, therefore, not have the opportunity of a second vote? Should we not get a, a chance to change our minds. I've always been against a second referendum, but it's rather a difficult argument to rebut. And I said, there is a difference between Theresa May uh, 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 over a relatively short period of time and in the context of the Commons getting to try and persuade MPs to back her deal rather than the alternatives. That seems to me rather different to asking us as the population to go back through the bitter process of another referendum campaign, where we've got kind of better things to do, haven't we? I mean, we had our say. We listened to the arguments on both sides. There was exaggeration, in some cases, lies. There, there was cheating. But nonetheless, we got given our opportunity to vote. Why would, why, why would we want to do it again? So there, there, to my mind, there's a slight difference between May bringing her deal back, unpalatable though it is, and us having a second vote. But I'm open to persuasion because I found it rather a tenuous argument. I found it rather difficult to combat what was being said to me over the dinner table. Can you help me change my mind at this 11th hour? 0345 6060973. You could text in as well, 84850. You could tweet at LBC. And I'm joined now in the studio, as promised, by Aaron and Jay. He is a comedian, an actor, a musician. He's just returned to London, in fact, last week, precisely so that he could be here for what was going to be Brexit Day. He's been performing shows right across Australasia and various comedy festivals as well in the region over the past four months. His current 2019 show, I should tell you, is called Even More Twisted, which he'll perform daily at the Edinburgh Fringe between the 14th and 18th of August later this year. Check him out on the Edinburgh Fringe programme and check him out right here. What a privilege to have you with us. Thanks very much, Matt. Now, why did you come here? Are you, are you a glutton for punishment? Why did you come here as we face this national crisis? Why did you specifically want to be in this, in this country, in this town, when we were facing probably the most divisive period in our history? Well, uh, I... The Civil War aside. <laughs> well, I've been here for 18 years, and I wasn't too sure that if I came back after the 29th, where the planes could land. Um, because did, it, your, did your plane land? My, well, I came back before the 29th, didn't I? Um, but the thing was, I wasn't too sure what was actually going to happen, mm. and um, a lot of people were doing, like, doomsday prepping. I've got, I've got a couple of friends that were actually doing that. But the thing is, like, I was thinking, well, are we going to go Mad Max, full Mad Max or not? I came back and uh, the first thing I could think of is uh, I've got to buy a lot of toilet paper because if we're going to go Mad Max, full Mad Max, I want, I want to be dignified and civil about the whole thing. So I actually did buy six months' worth of toilet paper. So um, that was the first thing I bought when I came back. Where is that toilet paper now? It's in my apartment, uh, stuffed in various places. Is this a true story? This is a true story. What does six months' worth of loo paper actually look like? Because I was in the pound shop the other day and I got three big packs of loo paper and that probably won't last me six months i think it probably might only last. I'm, I'm i'm an over user and i'm going to overshare now as well i'm an over user of loo papers so that might only get me through a fort now how how many rolls is six months worth I bought, of loo paper um the way i use them uh, it'll be like 50 rolls oh you you are a man of discretion when it comes to your your toiletry habits <laughs> yeah, pretty well. Um, I'm very conservative. What else have you bought in, in, in stockpiling? I've al always, um, I keep about two weeks of water. 
Um, I've always done that anyway um, because I drink a lot of water. Um, and in terms of those army ration packs, I, I've got two months' supply of that. But I, I bought that years ago just on a whim. I think it was like 3 o'clock in the morning after I'd gone out and had a lot of alcohol and it seemed like a good idea. And those packs, I think, last for about 20 years or something like that. Um, but one thing, though, I did try some of it, and then um, it does block your system up. So <laughs> you really don't want to go in the battlefield, I guess. So well, if it blocks your system up, then you don't, don't need to use so much loop paper. Absolutely. Tell us, having done quite a bit of touring around Australasia, how you compare the state of things in this country to what's going on the other side of the world? Oh, man. Um, what perspective do you bring? How can you help us out of this fix? You sound like a man who cares. Well, the thing is, you, you know, no matter what country I go to, they all have their own same problems. Um, you've got the issue like, um, you know, when they had the, uh, uh, the shootings in New Zealand, then you had the senator from Queensland actually come out and... Uh, basically gave a racist comment about the whole thing. Um, well, then you got... No, the he said it's not... I think he said something along the lines of, look, of course we shouldn't have violence, but... Yeah, but... Um, there's always a but, and he's with One Nation. Um, I don't know whether you know the name Pauline Hanson. She's been around for, like, 20 years. Um... When she actually first started her platform, she was talking about Mother England and Mother England will help us out, and it's like... Where are you coming from, woman? You know, um, this wasn't the senator who came out with that controversial statement. This no, no, no. This is a person in a party. Who I think she. I, I don't know. I don't keep in touch with, or I don't keep up to date with all the Australian politics. I generally try and keep abreast of what's happening here. And I was actually being away. I was literally every day trying to figure out what's happening with Brexit. And I mean, every day it was changing. Every day it was changing. And then I come back and then there's this march from Sunderland. What the hell was all that about? You had to pay 50 pounds. Was there a buffet at the end of it? I don't know. Um, Would you have joined had there been? It depends what the buffet was, actually. Um, I was in a very peculiar position at this wedding because I was sitting next to my sister-in-law, one of my sister-in-laws, and I'm on this sort of weird diet whereby I don't eat wheat and I don't eat sugar, so I've bored listeners right. with already. But I am allowed to eat as much as I want of other stuff, in my mind anyway. Yep. So I kept finishing her leftovers. Oh, right. How's that work out for you? Pretty well, actually. It was very good. <laughs> Sometimes food at weddings is a bit bland because it it's mass-produced. It is mass At my food. wedding, we had six courses of Lebanese food yep. to go with the Jewish dancing later on. We had Arab influence, Jewish influence. We got married in a church, 12th century church. It was a very multi-ethnic, multi-religious affair. Unlike the uh, the march. <laughs> Unlike the march. What, the Did you see what John, march. Yeah, exactly. Did you see what Jon Snow actually said? Um, and I think... Um, was it Channel 4 retracted it or something like that? I did read something of that. He did mention some of that. Uh, he'd never seen so many white people in the, same, in the same place or something like that. Well, this is what I said when I was introducing Richard Dawkins at the Hay Festival last year to 1,800 people and I was on stage with him. And I said, yeah. I said something along the lines of, this is a very unsurprisingly white affair. Because it was. It was right in the middle of... Well, it's actually not right in the middle of Wales. It's on the border of Wales and England. And it was this sort of, it's a literary festival, very famous literary festival, and it was horrifyingly white. Nothing wrong with being white. Nothing. I mean, no, I'm nothing particularly white no. myself. But you kind of want to have a bit of a mix. It, You're not white, are you? I'm Asian. Um, Eurasian, actually. Uh, Portuguese, Malaysian. Oh, you've got Malaysian blood in you? Yes. Yeah, I and that's no where idea. I was born. I was born. And the hair colour, because every comedian who has come into this studio and sat opposite me, as you are sitting opposite me now, almost every one of them, yeah. I think all the men, have had some form of orange or red in their hair or beard. And I can see a bit of an orange tint in there. It does, because I'm actually, in this, when I'm in the sun, the, uh, the hair colour actually changes a bit. You promise you haven't dyed it? Oh, I dye it. Oh, do yeah. you dye it? Yeah, I do. Why do you dye it? Um, why not? <laughs> well, I used to dye mine. I used to have peroxide hair when I was at university. It was two-tone. Yeah. And a girl sent over one of her friends to me in what was then the Fez Club. May still exist. This was yeah. many years ago, of course, in Cambridge. And she said, she passed on the message. It was music to my ears because she was very attractive. She said, the friend who was then using the messenger, the messenger yeah, said sure. to me, her friend really liked my hair colour. So I thought, right, I'm in there. So the last night of term, often I found at university there would be romance on the last day of term because the pressure was off. Of course, off. of course, yeah. you got to let go. 
unfortunately, the romance didn't quite materialise at that point. And when we came back for the new term, I decided to go back to my roots, which, right. as you can see, are ginger. Don't ever say that in Australia. It means completely different things, but anyway. I no. wouldn't dream of it. Yeah, okay. And you can explain why in a moment. I go back to my roots, go back to ginger, and she spotted me in the Cambridge Union, which I suppose was a breeding ground for my future career as an LBC presenter. Oh, yes. And a messenger was sent to me again. I don't think the same one. And this time it was, she's no longer interested because your hair colour's changed. Now, you can imagine, as someone who'd struggled with being red-headed for so many years, yeah. to be told that I was no longer found attractive because I had returned to my original colour hair, that was a bit of a blow. So, is your original colour hair red? This is my original colour, yes. OK. But it's not really red, is it? It kind of is. What do you think it is? I don't know. In the light, it looks uh, very, I don't know, coppery. Uh, I don't know. Do you like it? It looks good. Thanks. Yeah. yeah I like yours. Great. But you still haven't told me why you diet, other than the, why not. Um, it's easy to see on stage. Um, <laughs> what do you do on stage? How do you make I play, people I play laugh the guitar. I play, I play the guitar. And I always, um, I, a lot of my comedy is about relationships. Um, and I'm trying to stray away from that because it's, uh, I mean, I think I've done that old chestnut now for a couple of years. And I started doing a bit of uh, apolitical slash political stuff. Um, but... I don't know. I'm, I'm never going to be. I'm no, never going to be in that space. But I started writing a musical, um, and that's why this is the last time I'm going to probably perform a lot of my songs. Started writing a mu musical um, called The Testicle Testaments, <laughs> and um, it's about. I don't know if you've ever seen the um, vagina monologues. I've always wanted to do a, a guy's response to that. And my quest this year is just to interview a lot of guys and try and see what I can find hooks um, that I can actually put into a song and then, like, you know, basically do a whole narrative on a guy's evolution, you know? Okay, well, here I am. Start interviewing me. <laughs> and you can put it into a song a little later on. So when was the first time you actually discovered there was something between your legs? That's a very good question, but a difficult one to answer. I suspect when I was two, three, maybe. I okay. remember. I do remember my dad when I was four, maybe five, at my primary school, just off Kensington High Street, and he used to have to take me into the loo to teach me how to do a wee. Hang on. Um, who was this? Was this your dad, was it? This is my dad, yes. Be, okay, careful, well, be careful what you say about him. No, I was, it was all totally I, I legit. I didn't listen to that first. I thought it was some guy in a raincoat. Oh, no, definitely like wasn't a raincoat. No, my dad's not a keen raincoat wearer. But he, no, he, he would. Were you not taught how to do a standing up wee by your dad? I can't even remember. I remember having a potty. Yes, um, I had a potty. Yeah, but then, like, yeah, at, at some point you stand like a man. Yeah, and and, and you, you just go, did that freestanding. You weren't given any help or assistance. I can't really remember. No, no, I think I did it by myself. Come to think of it. I once did a number two in my fire engine and that didn't go down well with my mother. I can't remember ever doing that sort of stuff. I I, can, I can, it's, it's bringing back horrible flashbacks. She was absolutely and understandably furious with me. This is not the sort of thing you do <laughs> as a three-year-old child. Well, it was the sort of thing, unfortunately, that I did. Yeah. No, How did we get to this from I the B really word? I really don't know. We were talking about Brexit, weren't we? The B word. Could you, could you somehow interweave into your next musical edition the fact that I went to the loo in my fire engine? Possibly. Uh, I need to find some rhyming words. Uh, I need to find a narrative about it. <laughs> Before we go to a break, tell me about how relationships work with your comedy. Um, like, I've been through a lot of relationships and also have a lot of friends who are in relationships, and they're funny to watch as well, especially the dynamics between the male and female. Um, it's You're like talking ab as, about human beings almost as though we were some sort of species on safari between the male and the female? Pretty well. It, it, it is true when they say, you know, uh, men are from Mars, uh, women from Venus. When I, you say it's true? I think it's true. I think, um, I think we... Like, as a uh, as a, as males and females go, we we all on, you know, there, there's something that brings us together definitely, mm. but we're always on different tracks. It's like I, I don't know whether you've ever seen the uh, the uh, a joke or a clip about what what a man's actually thinking, and um, and there was a show called Coupling that did this really really well, where basically had a split split screen and the guy comes home and he's really really drunk and he's knocking things over as he's drunk. And then you see the girl actually seeing it a bit later on, and she's thinking, oh, he doesn't love me anymore. And it's completely not related, but... Um, I think I might have seen that, Do, yes. do you remember that? I think I That was really that. funny, yeah, yeah, yeah. and I thought, that's exactly the way things are. That is exactly the way things are. Because I could be, and um, I've been in a relationship where I'm not kidding, um, I, I fell asleep on the couch, I woke up and there's like 70 
text messages and the last one saying, I hope you have a nice life. And it's like, <laughs> I just fell asleep, man. <laughs> Give me a break. So that didn't last. But no, yeah. I, I, I can well understand. How did those 70 text messages go down? Um, well, I didn't read all of them. I just read the last one. I thought, <laughs> OK, if, if that's the case, I'm just going back to bed. Well, we're coming back in just a moment. This is Matt Stadden with Aaron AJ. And by the way, we have di- 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 digressed. But if you'd like to tell me what you think we should do next and whether you can convince us that a second referendum is an entirely reasonable option, given that Jacob Rees-Mogg and Boris Johnson and, and Dominic Raab and David Davis have been allowed to change their minds in backing Theresa May's deal, this is your opportunity. 0345 6060 973, text 84850, tweet at LBC. This is Matt Sadden every Saturday and Sunday mornings, 1 till 5, because the those clocks have sprung forward as they do once a year don't forget they spring forward at this time of year and they fall back in the fall as the americans would say the time now is not 20 past two but 20 past three this is lbc with matt stadlin call 0345 6060 973 tweet at lbc text 84850 Right, I'm off. Aaron AJ is going to field your calls on Brexit. He's very well qualified. He's worked as an information technology auditor. He's worked as a management consultant and on commodities, on the commodity trading floor as an analyst. He's worked as a project manager for various clients delivering new IT systems, as well as a disaster recovery and business continuity specialist. He's also worked as an IT security specialist. He's worked as an IT business risk specialist. And believe it or not, he's worked as a medical risk specialist during the 2014 Ebola crisis. He's also a comedian, aren't you? I am. Aaron. <laughs> Amongst other things. Today is Mother's Day, and it, we have stripped our mothers of... We have. We've taken an hour away from them. Seems awfully ha- unfair. Bad timing. Absolutely. Who do you think plans Mother's Day? The government. No, I, I don't really know. Don't they do it by, like, lunar cycles or something like that? I don't really know. Have you got a present for your mother? Is she still well, with us? Well, no. Um, my mother's in Australia. The um, Mother's you were Day. Say she's in a better place. Well, nah. she is in a better well, she place. She is in a better place. It's warmer. <laughs> um, basically, Mother's Day in Australia is on the 12th of May. So the first year I was here, I didn't realise that. And actually, for a couple of years, I didn't realise it. And what I was doing is sending the card, like now. And then it would get there weeks beforehand. And, like, I was an absolute hero because my mum would tell all of her friends, Aaron sent me a card. (laughs) He sent me a card, like, weeks before. And the fact that I didn't really realise it was different. Well, that's brownie points. Remind us why you think Brexit is such a brilliant idea. It's not a brilliant idea, I can tell you that. I mean, working in a city, I have had first-hand um, experience as to what's actually happened. I was actually doing work at a bank last year who decided to change their strategy and move most of their business across to Frankfurt. And um, I was a contractor there, and you know, I was one of the casualties. Um, and then usually when I come back... Hang on, so you already have lost your job because of Brexit? Yeah, I have, actually. So yeah. Ian Duncan-Smith, when he was telling me on LBC that there wouldn't be a single job, job lost if we left without he a He lied. Deal, he lied. <laughs> but, I mean, there, there are a lot of people because um, from that particular place, I think there was like over 200 people that were impacted. Now, I think they would have got paid out or whatever like that. But the, as far as I know, um, I don't know where, you know, what are we looking for? Sovereignty jobs? Uh, I, I don't know. Everyone says sovereignty, sovereignty, sovereignty jobs. Uh, <laughs> you know, that's just what I keep on saying. It's like where are these new jobs going to come from? And are these people probably in a year or so going to be, they're actually going to put a strain on, you know, on our system. What do you think the uniform would be for a sovereignty job? (laughs) Like the beef eaters of the Tower of London, perhaps? Yeah, yeah, I think something with a union jack, because, like, every time I see a picture of somebody putting, um, you know, talking about sovereignty, there's always a union jack involved and somebody with a bald head. That's all I I ever see. Um, Possibly a moustache or two as well. Possibly, possibly. But generally, what what the hell, you know, I, I... what is the deal with bald-headed men and Brexit? I don't really, I don't really get when it. When I was in Australia many years ago, when I was a, a mere youngster, a youth, yeah, I was rather surprised by the attachment that many Australians had to the Queen. I think you had a referendum probably around the time I went there in the we late nineties. It was the late nineties, yeah, yeah, late 90s, yeah, yeah, I was yeah. Ninety-nine. But tell me this: given that the Queen is your monarch, yep. In what sense is the the British the, the British national anthem, the English national anthem, also yours? No, it's not. It's not. Um, our I, national I know anthem it's not. It's is like advanced Australia advanced fair. Australia fair. But given that she is your monarch, why is our national anthem, "God Save the Queen," not also on some level yours? Well, it used to be until about 1976, 77, when that came in. I remember when I first started school. 
um, it was God Save the Queen, and around like the mid seventies, it sort of like all changed. Um, there was a competition. Um, uh, believe it or not, um, Walsing Matilda was one of the contenders, but Walsing Matilda is about uh, sheep stealing. So I don't know. You could actually take that all the way back, you know. It's a, a national rather sad song that Walsing Matilda. It's quite dark, isn't it? It's quite dark um, because basically he's uh, he's stealing sheep. Okay. <laughs> That's a national anthem. I, I don't know, but... Hang on. Sorry, isn't this an opportunity to make a, sh- a sheep noise? He so, would never do that, he says. Oh, OK. Apparently okay. it's racist against the Welsh. But we always, we, 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 we're not racist against the Welsh because I've got Welsh blood in me and I go to Wales the whole time. Terry's in Croydon. Terry, very good morning to you. Yeah, good morning. So, what would you say to my friend in the studio here, Aaron AJ, the Australian comedian, who says that Brexit is a terrible idea and he lost his job because of it? It hasn't even happened. Well, the first one I'll say that God Save the Queen uh, was written by an American. Um, the second thing I'd say is, look, I'm not very educated, but surely a democracy is the will of the people. Mm. And if 51%, if you give a referendum, a referendum to 100 people and 51% say we want to leave and 49 say no, then, in, you know, you don't say, well, that's too close to call, we're have another one or I think what it is the, the rule and elite think that the working class people who voted are too stupid to understand the implications we know I know the implications these agreements that were were basically go back 30 years um, France vetoed us from going into the common market in the 70s um, it, it, it would take 20 or 25 years to untangle all these agreements you know, it's not going to happen overnight. But after the referendum, the pol- what the politicians should have done, we pay them, we elect them, and we pay them. They should have right. 51% of them said we want to leave. Let's do what we can to justify what they voted for. And instead of that, all they've done is sit on the hill and put obstacles in the way. But I'm going to be I mean, played devil's advocate just for a moment. What if the will of the people changes? The will of the people isn't fixed yeah, but, in time forever, is it? No, it's not. Not no. I mean, it's not in time forever. But I mean, you. So what do you do then? You have a referendum. You don't like the result. You give it five years, mm. and you say, "Well, have another one." And if you, if result comes out wrong again, so you know what? We'll have another one. <laughs> you know, you can't keep going forever. Well, there's a lot of force to that. Let's let's see if Aaron can can rebut that more effectively than I can, because I have to say, Terry, I'm rather on your side, as you know. Go on, Aaron. Well, um, Terry, in in terms of the actual um, Brexit itself, there was a lot of falsehoods actually um, peddled by the Brexiters themselves. Um, But there was a lot of falsehood on both sides. Yeah, but more on the Brexiters' side. And and the Remain side hasn't been found guilty of anything, hasn't been found guilty of breaking electoral law. Exactly. Uh, I'm still wondering, what happened to that red bus? Where is it? Where, Where is, is it, Terry? No, 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 no. Look, you, look, look, I'm not being funny. You can't keep... The, this is... You're a comedian, yeah? And you, you keep talking about the red bus and all that. That's just one little snippet. Kind of a big one, happened. though. I think... I, I would suspect that quite a few people were influenced by it, wouldn't you, Terry, if you're being really honest? No, if I'm being really honest... Listen, let me tell you something. If I'm being really honest, I've got a daughter who lives in Australia. Well, she... Well, I've got two dolls. They've all been out in Australia, New Zealand. I love the food, uh, the freedom of movement and all that. The only problem I've got with Europe is it's not run by a government, it's run by a commission, and then people are not elected. If they make a mistake, who do they, who do they it's not entirely. Not the it's not entirely run by the commission. Of course, the commission, I suppose, is, is their rather beefed-up version of our civil service. You have the Council of Ministers, who are the leaders of all the 27 remaining states, and, and you have the European Parliament, which you and I do get to elect. We get to elect the British representatives. So jump in again if you if you want, Aaron. Yeah, well, um, and then we're now leaving it to the clowns in Westminster to actually run everything and make all the decisions, which they obviously can't do. They can't even do a lunch menu, I reckon. Aaron, AJ, don't go away. Terry, thank you for your contribution very much indeed in Croydon. In a moment, before we let Aaron escape the confines of the LBC studio in Leicester Square, he's going to do a little bit of music. Are you? Yeah, um, good. Later. Yeah. yeah, in a moment. <laughs> well, this is Matt Stadler with the comedian Aaron AJ. Matt Stadler on LBC. Call 0345 6060 973. Before we let Aaron AJ make his way out and into the night, two 
quite important pieces of information that I'd like to share with you about him. One is that he turns out to be a British citizen, so if you think he was an Aussie lecturing us on Brexit, think again. And the second is that he guests apparently as a paranormal investigator on various ghost hunting programmes. Yeah, Ghost Files Singapore, you find it on um, YouTube. Have you ever seen a ghost? No. So how could you be a ghost hunter then? Well, basically, there's a lot of equipment that we use that actually detects uh, electronic uh, magnetic fluctuations and so forth. So, um, so yeah, that's basically it. Um, I try and debunk as much as I can. I'm not, you know, un until I see something, and I've seen things out of the corner of my eye at certain certain places, but I want, I want, you know, proper evidence that I can actually um, show. And is there proper evidence beyond the fact that you lost your job? as a result of Brexit, before Brexit even happened. Is there proper evidence, do you think, that Brexit is going to be a disaster? I think there is. I mean, I don't know how she's going to get that fourth... If she's going to do a fourth vote. What, what do they say the definition of insanity is? Doing the same, same thing, thing again, again, and and again, again and again and again and again and, again. and expecting a different, a different answer. Result. Yeah, exactly. I mean, she's got to change... Um, she's got to change the submission significantly, whether... Which she can't do. She can't do. Because <laughs> the withdrawal agreement ain't going to be reopened. It's not open for surgery. So, exactly right. So, next week with the indicative votes, it's going to be very interesting to see what actually happens. Well, we had, what was it, seven or eight indicative votes over the past few days on yeah, Wednesday? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, yeah. and the answer, they came back, no, no, yeah, no, 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 no. no. Let's see what happens. But the thing Let's is, see what happens. Customs Union vote was very narrowly defeated. Possible that that could get through. As you say, it's indicative. It's not legally binding. And the problem with the Customs Union, if we were to have a Brexit that involved being part of the Customs Union, of course, yep. that would do Liam Fox out of a out of a job. Certainly Absolutely. In, certainly, in terms of doing trade deals with the rest of the world, free trade deals with the rest of the world, he's a key Brexiteer. And as I understand it the Tory manifesto made clear that we wouldn't be part of the customs union. Absolutely. So, it's a mess. <laughs> so, given that it's a mess, why don't we have a little music? Yeah, why not? Um, this song's, uh, I call it the government spending song. I think it's quite appropriate with uh, what's actually going on. Um, oh, before you start singing, I have one more question. Yeah, sure. As soon as you leave the studio, we're going to get b back to calls on whether they convince me, callers, that we should in fact have a second referendum. Where is the... Where is the fairness in the likes of Jacob Rees-Mogg and Boris Johnson changing their minds and voting for Theresa May's deal that they have rubbished consistently and vociferously and yet we the people don't get to change our minds? Well they put themselves and their party first, they don't put country first. Um, you know that's, that's the way I see it. Um, Boris, I mean if we had a bit more time, he, he did something in my neighbourhood around Canary Wharf, overturned a uh, council decision on his very last day. Um, not very happy about that, and it's uh, a lot of implications for my area. But, you know, he's only played for himself. That's so, my to, opinion. To be fair, I don't think that the damage you allege he's done to Canary Wharf is a particularly good reason for him not being Prime Minister. I can think of many others. <laughs> exactly. For example, the fact that he described women who wear a burqa as a pedal box. Not good. Yeah, not good. Not good at all. Um, Do please proceed with your musical treat. Okay. Um, government spending song, so... Quiet lab down in Sudbury There's a man who works for an agency In a job that some say is a mighty strange career He takes a bottle of ketchup and pours it out real slow And then he'll grab his watch and time how fast it will slow And then the government pays him 70 grand a year and Sometimes it comes out fast and sometimes it comes out slow And if it really helps him pass the time He'll listen to the radio Sometimes when he's really bored He'll pretend he's Captain This is your tax money at work Things were going slow in the Virgin Galactic program So Richard Branson asked for a government grant So he could send the Rolling Stones out into space Down in Oxford University Some professors asked for a subsidy So they could observe the way that earthworms defecate And sometimes it comes out fast Sometimes it comes out slow What's the point of this research? Heaven only knows Wonder when we'll benefit 
from the fruits of this research. This is your tax money at work. So we've given money to our MPs so they can claim second homes exclusively and claim for all those hotel pornos that they've seen. And Damien Hurst got his start by putting maggots on a cow head and calling it art and claiming 30 grand from the arts grant scheme. Subsidise some artsy fartsy stupid lava work. This is your tax money. This is our tax money. This is Very, very good. Thank very you. good. Who said you can't mix politics and music? Should we have a quick encore? <laughs> uh, no, I think a bit of No, it's really very good indeed. Very, very good. Thank Who you very much, Who said Matt. that you can't have music with speech radio? It's been an absolute pleasure to have you in the studio. Thank you very much. And thank you also for your contributions on Brexit. Really enjoyed it. Thanks for your time. Where can we find you, though? I think it's the Edinburgh Fringe, Edinburgh isn't it, Edinburgh Fringe, in 14th to 18th. Um, I'm, at, I'm at a place called Espionage, but if you remember the name, Aaron A-J, A-Y-J-A-Y, -A -Y, um, look me up on the uh, Fringe uh, programme. Good. And you take care on those streets of London as you go home. Thanks very much, Matt. Have a good take evening. Care. Thank you to Aaron AJ, comedian originally from Australia with a bit of Malay influence, but also a British citizen, fully entitled, not just to have his view on Brexit, but to have voted in the first place. Back to your calls, 0345 6060973. -60 Should we get the chance to change our minds, given that the likes of Boris Johnson and Jacob Rees-Mogg, Dominic Raab and David Davis have changed there's text 84850 tweet at LBC. James, the first time caller in Brixton. Very good morning to you. How are you doing? All right. Yeah. Have you enjoyed the musical interlude? I tell you what, that was very unexpected for LBC. I don't know if I've ever experienced that before. <laughs> it was a joy. Absolute joy. It was joyous, but it was also one of the most surreal experiences of my entire life. <laughs> Do you know what? I like, never have been, been serenaded by such a staunch Brexiteer. <laughs> I tell you what, if they bring that more, if that was there on uh, the Leave Means Leave March, then I tell you what, they'd be getting much better press than they are. They certainly would, although I'm afraid, James, you've, you haven't been listening and paying sufficient attention because Aaron AJ, by no stretch of the imagination, is a staunch Brexit. He's very much a Remainer. Oh, God, it's fake news. It's fake news. <laughs> it's fake I news. brought the worst part of the news to the news. I do apologise. I tell you what, quickly, James, when you talk about fake news, watching my friend get married, very sweet, he's very witty. Gave